country, the gun violence in our midst. In the past year, since AAUW proposed having this event, I have tracked information about gun violence. Sorry. While the violence continues unabated, there is now more and more data in the news about how violence affects us. A recent study by Every Town for Gun Safety compares the strength of gun laws by state and compares it to their rate of gun violence. We are lucky to be living in New Jersey, which is considered to be among the leaders in states with strong gun laws and has one of the lowest rates of per capita gun violence. Sounds good, but then, two, then just two weeks ago, I read an op-ed piece written by a local high school student terrorized by the epidemic of gun violence and asking when people will be able to talk rationally about how to com combat it without the polarization of politics. And I quote, let's bridge the divide, break the silence, and work together to create a society where the trauma we endure today doesn't become the legacy we leave for the generations that follow. Returning to school in the fall should be a time when we live out our dreams, not wait in fear for the nightmare of gun violence to strike. Tonight, we will hear from representatives of local organizations. Each will provide an overview of their organization, what they are doing to address gun violence, how they support our communities, and how our communities can support them. We will then open up for questions from the audience. To assist with questions that may be outside the purview of these three organizations, we have invited representatives from the Chatham Police, and we did also invite the local school districts but I have the feeling with back to school, they're probably a little busy. So as Anne already told you, we are thrilled to have uh, these two fine officers in the audience. The first panelist speaking tonight is Nancy Hedinger. She's the president of the League of Women Voters of the Morristown area. She has been active in the New Jersey state and local organization for many years. She will be presenting an overview of recent legislation in New Jersey that focuses on guns. The League monitors New Jersey legislation on policy issues for which they have a position since they believe that an educated public is essential to democracy. Then we have Teresa Palero. Got that close. Close. <laughs> I'm sorry. A volunteer leader in Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, who is in her eighth year of volunteering. Thank you. Founded in 2012, the Moms Organization works in many ways to reduce gun violence. You may have heard of their SMART program, which helps adults have productive discussions about gun safety and responsible gun storage. And finally, we have a representative from our next generation, Raisa Rubin Stankiewicz, the state policy advocate for March for Our Lives, New Jersey. Raisa has served in that position since June 2020, leading efforts to pass gun violence prevention policy in New Jersey. She's a senior at Rutgers University, and as you can see, she will be joining us virtually. <laughs> she is standing in for the founder of the organization who could not be with us tonight. Thank you so much. Please remember that tonight's panel discussion is meant to be an information sharing forum, not a debate about guns. Gun violence exists, and we're trying to learn about the resources we have to come with, to grips with it and hopefully avoid it. 
So now I'd like to welcome Nancy to lead off with her remarks. Thank you, Susan. Um, so most of you know that the League of, I hope you know that the League of Women Voters spends a lot of time registering voters, holding candidates, debates, and forums, and basically working on voting rights issues. We have an arm that also works on advocacy, and we, we have positions on several issues that we come to after careful study. One of our, so and if, we're, if we have a position on an issue, we track legislation, we advocate or oppose that legislation depending upon what it is. Um, so the League has been um, tracking legislation on gun and gun safety and um, taking a supportive role with other organizations um, to, to prevent gun violence and, to, and for safe, sound gun legislation. So I was going to talk a little bit about where we are today in New Jersey and why we are where we, where we are. Um, at the League's position, I'll just quickly say that we support licensing procedures for gun ownerships by private citizens that include a waiting period for background checks, personal identity verification, gun safety education, and annual license renewal. Further, we support a ban on Saturday night specials, enforcement of strict penalties for the improper possession of and crimes committed with handguns and assault weapons, and regulating and monitoring gun dealers. There's more of the position, but that's a summary of some of the things we support. So what brings us here, what brings me here in the league, is that in June of last year, um, the, state, the Supreme Court of the United States issued an opinion in a case called New, Jersey, New York Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. And Bruin was the state, is the state superintendent in New York, uh, of, the New York of the New York police, state police. There was a law in New York that um, was centuries old that basically said that concealed, that it was, that was rendered unconstitutional by this decision. The law basically said that you had to sh show a justifiable need to carry um, a weapon in New York. Meaning, when you're applying for your license to carry, your permit to carry, you had to prove a justifiable need to have that license. The SCOTUS decision got rid of that justifiable need requirement, um, allowing a person to carry uh, without necessarily having a special need. And I thought it was interesting when I was looking at the decision, I wanted to share with you what the judges said in their, in their opinions. Um, Justice Alito, who wrote the majority opinion, said that the effect, of gun, on, the effect of guns on American society is irrelevant to the issue. Oh. Because oh. um, <laughs> he's supported by the Secret Service. Well, because the issue was the Second Amendment, um, any object objectivity or subjectivity of whether or not somebody had a, a reason, a personal reason. Kavanaugh, supported by Roberts, said that many state restrictions requiring background checks, firearm training, check, check on mental health records, and fingerprinting are still permissible because they're objective in contrast to the discretionary nature of the New York law. Um, and then Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, in their dissent, said that states should be able to pass restrictions in an effort to curb the number of deaths caused by gun violence, and the court's decision, quote, severely burdens the state's efforts to do so. And when they issued that decision for New York, they were, they, it affected seven other states, including New Jersey, who had similar laws that said that you had to show um, cause to be able to carry a, a firearm. So in response, um, Governor Murphy issued an executive order asking all the state departments to, to do review their rules and the regulations and identify actions that could be taken um, to determine whether and what manner firearms could be carried in New Jersey. And in December of 22, the governor signed a bill um, that strengthened restrictions on who's eligible to carry and established a list of places where people with permits to carry cannot bring firearms called sensitive places. I think people have heard about the whole sensitive places issue. What are sensitive places? In New Jersey, they determined that there were three types of sensitive places. High density locations, locations of, of vulnerable populations, and you're going to tell me the third one. 
and at locations with government and First Amendment activity. So when they refer to sensitive places, they're to high density locations, they're talking about entertainment venues, zoos, um, youth sporting events, and other recreational facilities where bars and restaurants where alcohol is being served, airports and public transportation, hubs, those are high density. Locations of vulnerable populations refers to schools, colleges, universities, daycare and child facilities, health care facilities, uh, long-term care and nursing care facilities, correctional institutions, juvenile justice institutions, and homeless shelters. I think those are kind of obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Locations with governmental and First Amendment activity are polling places, which the League was very happy to see, <laughs> courthouses, law enforcement, stations and offices, government buildings, and locations for government meetings, and also demonstrations and protests and licensed public gatherings. And we, we have several of those, so it's comforting to know that, at least in New Jersey, um, you're not supposed to be carrying them. It also set a default rule that firearms cannot be carried on private property, like individual homes or businesses, stores, and houses of worship, without expressly without express communicated permission, meaning that unless someone says you can carry in their store or in their home, you cannot carry there either. The bill also required um, four endorsements of character when you're applying for a permit. It required the permit carriers to maintain and provide proof of liability insurance. It increased the fees for a permit from $2 to $25 because you have to administer all this stuff. <laughs> and it expanded the inelig ineligibility for the following groups. There are persons with outstanding arrest warrants um, for an indictable offense, persons subject to certain restraining orders, persons subject to restraining orders in other jurisdictions, and persons subject to voluntary admissions to mental institutions and hospitals. That's like the red flag the laws you hear about. But in January, a judge, a judge uh, in New Jersey issued a temporary restraining order, basically saying that we need to look at this law, it's not constitutional. Um, and she blocked part of New Jersey's handgun carry law in May. The court order blocked state officials from enforcing the law, which barred lawful carry of firearms in certain places. Among the places covered by the order, within 100 feet of certain public gatherings, zoos, bars, restaurants, entertainment facilities. It also blocked the insurance mandate required that was required. Um, and, it, and, and, her, and her justification was that the New Jersey law prevented a law-abiding citizens with ordinary self-defense needs from exercising their rights to keep and bear arms. But in June, <laughs> the Federal Appeals, appeals Court temporarily agreed to keep part of the New Jersey law in effect as, as the proceedings play out. Now, the, the, this hearing is happening, the, the decision is being made sometime this fall, we're told. We should be getting a, a, a real final decision from the Third Circuit. Um, but in the interim, he granted the New Jersey uh, Attorney General's request to keep part of the law that bars people from carrying handguns in sensitive places in effect. St we're still blocked from carrying guns in vehicles or movie sets, and um, only permitted in retail stores unless expressly prohibited. They still got rid of the insurance mandate. Um, they kept the increase in permit fees. But the ones that we care most about are the sensitive places, and that's what's being litigated right now. And that's what we should be hearing about at the end of the fall. They say in the fall sometime. I don't know if you know more about that, the timing, but. Um, the league has an amicus in the, on the national level on some of this stuff, but I don't think we're, we're not in an amicus at the state level on this. But I'm assuming moms is involved. Uh, I think national moms is involved, but at the volunteer level, I, I don't have that information. Yet. So I'm going to move. I'm going to pass it over to Teresa. Sure. You have a background now on the law and SCOTUS. So thank you, Nancy. That was really very informative. Um, so I'm here tonight to share with you who Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America is and what you can do. I think uh, now that you've heard all of this, I think it's really important for me to also share with you 
a little bit about how we got here. Um, and for the better part of the 20th century, uh, the United States uh, worked under the assumption that the Second Amendment was related to a well-regulated militia. And, and things cruised along in that manner. And around the 1970s to 1980s, the National Rifle Association began a concerted effort to begin to dismantle what had been in place all of these years. And they paid people to write scholarly articles about how this is not just related to a well-regulated militia, but also was related to an individual's right. And I think all in all, 24 articles were written. At the time that, that this was happening in the 70s and 80s, there was nobody paying much attention, nobody rebuking it. So it continued on, and it led to a decision, the first decision that affected uh, the Second Amendment rights as we knew it for the better part of the century, and that is the decision of uh, District of Columbia versus Heller. And that was a case before the Supreme Court in 2008, which changed the game, so to speak, and uh, ruled that an individual does have a right to bear arms in their home for the purposes of safety. And not much happened between then and Bruin. Um, 2010, the similar law that existed in District Columbia exist, existed in Chicago, and the Supreme Court heard that, and they ruled in the same way that they did for the District of Columbia. And, uh, and then we have what Nancy just very aptly explained to you. And I think it's really important to understand that when Bruin hit the Supreme Court and came before them, the Supreme Court looked different than it did 10 years ago. And it will look this way for the foreseeable future because of the changes that occurred in the five years prior to this ruling. So I don't know about you, but when I heard this ruling, I was, um, I, I was and I am uh, disheartened by it. I think it endangers us on very many le levels. I think it endangers police officers. So what can you do about it? Well, you can join me and 10 million other supporters in our efforts to uh, end senseless gun violence. Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America was started 10 years ago, the day after Sandy Hook by Shannon Watts, when she was sitting at her kitchen table and she created a Facebook page. It has now morphed into an institution that um, has a survivor network, a students demand action network, and the largest grassroots um, volunteers that are fighting to uh, end gun violence. And ways that we do that. Uh, we are, again, 10 million supporters strong now, and we fight for, at the state level, to make sure that bills that come forth that are going to move forward gun sense, that there are people in the chambers and there is a concerted effort via phone banking uh, or meeting with our legislators to get those bills passed. Um, so if any of you out there want to join us, the easiest way to join us is to text READY to 64433. You fill out the work, it gets you on our text and email list uh, and uh, you can begin taking some volunteer actions with us. Part of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, part of what we do is public education campaigns, and we strive to educate the public in the best ways possible to safeguard you and your loved ones from senseless gun violence. So one of our programs is called Be Smart, and that is a, a parental educational program that teaches about safe firearm storage. We at Moms Demand Action believe in the Second Amendment, but we believe with that right comes responsibilities. And so you, all adults are responsible for the safe storage of their firearms, and we teach how to safely store your firearms. So that is one piece, and, and we give lectures, and we're available to um, share literature. You can go to besmart.org and learn more about the program. That is uh, one of our public education programs. The second public education program is uh, called One Thing You Can Do. And there are several states, I think we're up to 16 states with uh, extreme risk protection orders, otherwise sometimes called red flags. Uh, and New Jersey is one of them. And so what does that mean? That means if you see that your loved one is exhibiting signs or symptoms that they want to harm themselves or potentially others, you can 
go to your local police department and fill out, um, complete the procedure to begin to set in motion a hearing that will temporarily make them unable to be able to purchase firearms and remove those firearms from the home. And this is really important because gun violence in America takes over 120 lives a day. The largest portion of gun violence in America is death um, by suicide. And it is important to note that when someone um, has that much despair that they are attempting to end their life, using a firearm is nine times more lethal uh, than any other method. And if we can get that person beyond that critical period where they're despondent, and we keep the firearm out of their way, the likelihood that they're gonna get past that and live a happier life is exponentially higher. So we need to teach adults to safely store firearms. Um, and one thing you can do is a law that was signed in 2019 in, here in New Jersey, and any of your local police departments are fully aware of how you can um, enact that. Uh, and those are our two pieces of public education program. I think that's, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. You're ready. You're fine. Can you all hear her? No. no. Okay, wait, hold on, Raisa. <laughs> We're going to work on the volume. We have to work on the volume. Is there's a, there's a, there's a, should we put no. this plus sign? Sorry. Hold on. Hold on. They're all good. What if I do it? No, no, no. no. Just, add, just hit the plus sign? Just hit the plus sign. That's the volume. I just lost her. You guys. Uh, oh. Okay, we'll get her back. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just minimize that. Okay. Where's the volume? That's the volume. Let's see. Hold on. Pepper speak. Increased it. Start speaking, Riza. She could speak closer to the computer. Can you speak closer to your computer? That's getting better. That's a little better, is, yeah. Is the volume coming out of the, the yeah. actual laptop or out of so? It's supposed to be coming out of the owl. What, what yeah, so you have to change this setting on the uh, Chief, come on up here. Yeah. You know how to do this? Let's yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chief to the rescue on many years. We'll give it a shot. <laughs> We're not just good with guns, folks. <laughs> <laughs> is there any questions while we're waiting? I have a question. I mean, do you want to just talk? I don't know what you want to do. I have uh, to oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Nan. I had a question too, but go ahead. You said that under the red flag laws, you have a right to go to the police department and ask for help. But when we, in New Jersey, we have a must report uh, law about abuse we see yes, with children. You do. Wouldn't, shouldn't that be also a must report if you, find someone in the family or a friend who's in trouble? Well, I think what the information that I'm sharing with you is the information about how the red flag extreme risk protection order is written. Now, I think there's a difference between the legal aspect of that and then the moral aspect of that. So I understand what you're asking, but I, I, I don't have the ability to answer that, but I hear what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, it's All right, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead. Can you list the sensitive places in this uh, current um, bill? Or, so you, uh, you, if you want to see them all, you can Google it. The um, 2019, uh, I'm sorry, December of 2022. And we can listen. Well, we're getting it. Whoa. Um, Does she want to try to talk? To you? Talk again. Rise and talk. Should I try and sing? That's good. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you now. Perfect. I know there was a question being answered. I can wait until after the question is answered or I can go into it now. No, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry that it was such an eventful uh, 
me joining this conversation. Thank you so much to um, Madison AUW, to the League of Women Voters Morristown, and to Long Transaction for um, for bringing this event together and for inviting me to participate virtually. I know, as it was demonstrated, it was extra work for you, so I really appreciate it. Um, I think I really want to start, um, I like the way that the conversation begun. First of all, um, a really wonderful job explaining what has been happening in New Jersey around the Bruin decision, and also sort of giving a context of how the current environment that we have around um, gun violence, around any kind of efforts to pass gun violence prevention legislation came to be. Um, so I really, really appreciate my fellow panelists for kind of giving that background. Um, I, I want to sort of start by also really appreciating the fact that Ruth began this panel um, writing about the op-ed that a high school student wrote about being really traumatized by gun violence and placed in a really, in a completely unfair position of having to live like that and live as though it is no formal. And I think that that is very much unfortunately not an uncommon experience. And I think that I think that the call that this high school student made in the op-ed is incredibly important. And I'm really glad that we're having a conversation today to try to meet that call. I also want to introduce myself a little bit and introduce March for Our Lives. So my name is Ray Sibibin Stankwitz. I am the state policy advocate for March for Our Lives New Jersey. Um, March for Our Lives is a youth-led movement to try to end gun violence in the United States. We began in 2018 in the aftermath of the Parkland and Coral Springs shooting um, in Florida. And the organization began by organizing a national march on Washington, D.C. with over 400 sibling marches um, internationally to push for an end to the complacency around gun violence, to push for action, even as um, federal gun violence prevention legislation has been stagnant. Um, and so that, that was really how March for Our Lives rose to prominence. And then again, last year in June 2022, after the Buffalo and Uvalde shootings, um, March for Our Lives marched again internationally to try 450 marches um, across the country and from around the world to basically say we, we we marched before we are not seeing the kind of changes that we need to be seeing. This is problem of gun violence is statistically only getting worse and there needs to be action taken right now. Now the aftermath of the June 2022 march did lead to the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act being passed at the federal level and a number of state gun violence prevention legislation, including in New Jersey, the passage of the Gun Safety Package 3.0, which was seven or eight um, gun violence prevention uh, bills. I won't go into detail about what all of them are because that is way more information than I have time to share. Um, but it included things like um, holding gun manufacturers in the gun industry accountable for um, breaking public nuisance laws, which basically means that the Attorney General can now hold them liable for malpractice in the sale or marketing firearms. It also included a bill that anyone who is seeking a firearm purchaser identification card, which is basically allows you to buy uh, guns in in the state, in the country, um, they have to um, take a safe storage kind of basic gun safety course. So it was legislation like that, and it's something that um, March for Our Lives New Jersey is really proud to have worked to pass along with Moms Demand Action, along with Brady, along with the um, with um, Coalition for Peace Action, Unitarian Universalist Faith Action New Jersey, and a number of other organizations that were part of the uh, New Jersey Gun Violence Prevention Network. So that is sort of where we've come from in the state. Um, and in particular, what March for Our Lives seeks to bring to this movement is uh, we are a youth-led organization. 
Uh, we understand that the impacts of gun violence uh, um, it impacts everybody in this country, but it particularly impacts you. And while it particularly impacts you, and while there is a recognition of the desire to have youth voices in the room, when it comes down to it, we know that in the halls of power, our voices are very, very rarely present, not because of a lack of trying, but just because that's the reality of how our political systems are set up. Um, they're not set up in a way that it's easy for high school and college students to come to committee meetings and to share their perspectives. Um, they're not set up in a way that we're even taught in schools how to use our voices to advocate for ourselves. Um, instead, you know, we learn that from a very young age that we are impacted by gun violence, that we feel that threat. But when it comes to actually um, being able to have any sort of feelings of, you know, oh, what can we do to combat this? Um, well, it's, it's very aspirational messages, but not necessarily a lot of how can we actually change things? So um, I, I want to also, I definitely know we're going to go more into detail in the Q&A, so I don't want to, um, I want to talk more about some of the legislation that March for Our Lives New Jersey is advocating on, um, but I also know that I've been a little policy heavy, so I think I'll end out my remarks by talking a little bit about another thing that I think is really important um, to bring to this discussion, which is when we're having a discussion about what ending gun violence entails, I think we need to understand the root causes that drive gun violence in our country. Why it is that the United States has such an issue with gun violence. Um, and um, there, there's a model that was developed within March for Our Lives that I think is really powerful um, called the Five Forces. Um, and basically, a very quick rundown of it, I mean, most people are recognize the fact that there is um, the access to guns in our country um, without any kind of restrictions is a huge issue, um, but that also plays into a larger culture of how guns are glorified in our country in a sense, and the ways in which we equate having a gun with safety, with self-defense, even though if you look at the statistics, the presence of so many guns actually makes us collectively less safe not only as a society, but even in our homes, um, especially if we do not have measures put in place around safe gun storage. Um, gun violence in our country is also driven by political apathy and corruption that allows the NRA to have as much power as it does, um, and that continually tries to um, push towards voter suppression efforts as opposed to expanding our democracy and making it easier for our voices to be heard. The gun violence prevention crisis in our country is driven by poverty because when people do not have the ability to meet their basic needs, one of those needs being safety, feeling fundamentally safe, that drives a need to have a gun and that drives gun violence. Um, the gun violence prevention crisis is driven by uh, the national mental health crisis and the way that people with mental illness are more at risk of dying of gun violence, whether it be by suicide or in um, police-related shootings. Um, and finally, um, the last force that fuels gun violence in our country is the way that guns are used to reinforce um, systems of supremacy, systems of power, whether that be in the context of domestic violence um, or in the ways that we see um, shootings on the basis of um, racial, homophobic, transphobic, um, misogynistic grounds. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for allowing me to join virtually. I'm really excited to continue to have this conversation. So Raisa, I'd like to say I cannot wait until <laughs> every one yeah. of your peers, and it's happening now, becomes a, of age to vote. <laughs> you are going to change the narrative. You will change the narrative. Thank you for that excellent overview. And run for office. And run. That's yeah, right. that's good. Right. Right. I have one more comment to add, and um, I think it's really important to understand that we in America continue to live 
this uniquely American nightmare because we have elected officials in office who refuse to act. And it is really imperative that everyone understand who their elected officials are and how they vote on ending or not ending gun violence. And an easy way for you to learn that both here in New Jersey and nationally is by going to gunsensevoter.org, which is an organization in, that uh, collates people, uh, people who are running for office, who have um, filled out a questionnaire and have uh, said that they will vote in support of common gun sense solutions. We are living this uniquely American nightmare because we have elected officials who fail to act. If your elected official is failing to act, vote them out. And what was that website again? Gunsensevoter.org. Gunsense? Gunsense. Gun sense. Sense. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kathy. Hi. So the voters vote for people who are in the legislature, and there are bills before the legislature, but you were talking about court decisions. So, and I know that uh, politicians, you know, uh, appoint judges, but most elected officials aren't involved in that. So I just wanted to understand which you think is more important, the judiciary or the legislature in, uh, in gun violence, uh, what do you call it? From my perspective, and I'm not a legal scholar, I'm a volunteer. Uh, by profession, I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, my, we, depending upon who you vote into office, depends upon who is um, nominated to sit on your Supreme Court. Would that court have looked a lot differently if the election in 2017 was different. Uh, so I think they're equally as important. I would say the same thing. I mean, I think elections have consequences. We all know that. And we need to pay attention to all of these issues and vote, and vote for the people who share your values. I would like to add that. I would, I would say legislature, personally. Mm -hmm. I think because if they're passing laws that are grounded in the Constitution, that it never makes it to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is only going to decide issues that are in conflict or being uh, adjudicated based on a conflict. If the law is sound and it is justified, it is constitutional, then the Supreme Court really has no bearing on it at all. So there can be laws that are changed to make the gun sense common sense, to make laws safer for gun violence to, to increase safety that would seem rather common to majority of average Americans, but uh, apparently common sense is not all that common. <laughs> and if they were to pass the laws, it would really strip the need for the Supreme Court to have to consider. So my, my personal opinion would be legislature first, and then secondarily or indirectly, a very close second is having uh, a Supreme Court that's balanced and will decide these things uh, with the safety in mind. And I think it's important to understand, and I think the majority of us do, but there's both a state and a federal legislative level. And when I'm speaking, I'm answering you, I'm, I'm thinking of both the state and the federal legislative areas. And I think that this will haunt me for many years, what our Supreme Court looks like now, mm -hmm. and how it could have looked differently uh, had some had someone else been elected into office. And so I, I think that, again, I hear what you're saying, Chief, um, but it, it, it clearly is a balance and check. Um, and uh, educate yourselves. Tell all your friends to vote. Make sure you vote. Uh, I think everyone in this room probably does that. <laughs> and if you don't, see one of the leaks. <laughs> <laughs> Marisa, did you want to address that question? It was about whether or not uh, Supreme Court or legislature, the judicial system or the legislative system, I guess, is more important, important when it comes to controlling or gun safety. You don't have yeah. to, I'm just offering it up. Mm -hmm. 
It's a good question. It's a really good question. I think, um, I mean, our ability to have influence on the judicial system is through um, voting in elections for, you know, for um, legislative and presidential. So in a lot of ways, that's kind of, we can have an indirect influence on that. Um, but yeah, I think I think both are important. Um, I think um, the point I'm sure this point is being going to be made beyond me, but um, 2023 is often a year that doesn't get a lot of attention. We kind of are skipped over because of elections in 2024, but um, 2023 is New Jersey state legislative elections, so that is incredibly important. Um, so I think just just reiterating that um, the really the need to focus on on that and then after the elections um it's not only going to affect the composition of the new jersey legislature but what happens in the elections is also going to affect whether or not the new jersey legislature is going to want to do um take any sort of even somewhat controversial legislation um during the period after uh, the period after the election which is known as the lame duck period um, which is basically right before um, the two-year legislative session ends. Um, there's an effort to pass a whole bunch of legislation because um, otherwise it all has to be reintroduced. So I would say that the New Jersey legislative elections are not only important because they in and of itself are very important elections, but also because they're going to affect the mood of the legislature in one of the few times of the year where they actually um, pass Substantial amounts of legislation. So I would just so highlight that um, as an issue of importance. Excellent point. Very excellent point. We all live in fear of Linda. And doesn't work in the legislature is just like on the edge wondering, okay, which bills are going to get pushed? Right now because, because people leaving have nothing to lose. And a lot of our legislators are leaving this year. And um, people trade favors during yeah. Linda like crazy. So things you think would never get through, get through because for those reasons. Any other questions? I would like to uh, comment on what uh, uh, the Chief Lee said. I, I mean, I agree with what he said, but the reality is that regardless of uh, the, the good or bad of the legislation, there will be groups that will still go to court, still go to the Supreme Court. And, and regardless of how well thought out and reasoned and how you know constitutionally um, based legislation is, it's not gonna stop some group that doesn't like the legislation from taking the case all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so, it, you know, we have we have a system of government that has three branches and, and really they should be working together to create balance but right now our democracy is in jeopardy because we don't have balance yeah we have legislators who are afraid to act and uh candidates who are you know looking to create controversy despite the fact that i, I don't want to get too political but I, you know, I, I could do that all day. You know, I agree with you. I think it's important that you, you raise that point because Attorney Plankin worked really hard in drafting, or who, I'm not sure, all the parties that were involved in creating the bill that was passed in December of 2022. But they worked really hard and felt very strongly that this was a well crafted bill that was in line with the Constitution. Despite all of that, two gun right groups in New Jersey, there were two lawsuits, they were combined into one, just so everyone knows, they were combined into one and then that went to Bloom, I think, and then to the Third Circuit. Um, so there will always be those people to do it. I think you're absolutely right, that's a very good point. And, and the Rifle Association is a perfect example. I mean, they have, they have the most money and the most clout. And they're the oh, we're breaking in. We're breaking in. <laughs> <laughs> so we're breaking in. With that understanding, my point is, so certainly I, Chief, I think do, it's. Do you, do you want him up to come up front or is there? No, 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 no,
Well, no, no just because it's so rising yeah, right. here. Oh, we can, you should join right. us up here. Come join us. Yeah. <laughs> so the point I wanted to make, so obviously I think they're both super important, right? A, a balanced uh, judicial system and a balanced uh, legislative system. I just think that there, there are laws that they could consider now. Universal checks, universal uh, medical and, and uh, health, or rather health checks, that can be done and make uh, perhaps set up nationally. So the you know today when we're checking mental health for someone who's getting a permit to carry or a permit to purchase a firearm today, New Jersey is set up electronically, but we send out documents around the country to other That's counties. Right. These things would likely survive any test. So I think that. While the ju judicial system has, if it's unbalanced, the ability to reverse some of this, the reality is that really well done law that is done well. So we, and, and, and the AG did a good job, but it was done in haste, and it had to be done in haste, because when the Bruin case passed, it sort of uh, upended everything we had here in New Jersey. So I think it was- hey, it upended. It really did. <laughs> it it did. upended everything we knew. So you, keep, keep in mind, so all my years in policing, first starting off in the city of Orange in Essex County, which did uh, at the time have uh, quite a high violent crime rate, a lot of gun uh, violence. In fact, uh, the captain and I uh, worked with a, uh, two close friends of ours who were shot on the job while we were working down there. There were additional officers that were shot uh, and lots of routine gun violence in there. So this is very personal for us. Uh, I think that ultimately, there, there are items or, or constitutional ground laws that could easily be enacted that would likely survive a constitutional test. The Attorney General had to come up with procedures very quickly and, and often does. Uh, yeah, you know, in fairness, uh, I'm not always delighted with some of the policy decisions that come down from the Attorney General that come down in haste. And sometimes it's a matter of something they have to do and then I think in the wash, some of these things work themselves out, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as a great example, we're talking about recent marijuana legislation that involved juveniles. We're talking about alcohol with juveniles. This was policy and law sort of uh, like a train crash and trying to solve all of these problems that are complicated. I think this is another example of that. I think it's super important to have a balanced, don't misunderstand me, a balanced uh, judicial system, especially at the Supreme Court level but I think it's vital that we have politicians who will do what's in the best interest of the people. And it is clear, right, that the people in mass expect reasonable gun legislation that will protect the Second Amendment right for those that want to have a gun, but also protect those who do not want to have a gun and don't want to be confronted by one. I don't think it's unreasonable. And I think legislators, maybe in lame duck, who don't have anything to lose, maybe should actually toughen up a little bit and then push some of the, the better legislation instead of cowering to uh, some special interest groups. So, yeah. so, but I think they're both important. I think it's a really close second, if I were to. So I'm going to turn the conversation a little bit. It's a question for, for the, cap, uh, the chief. Um, if in, in Chatham Borough, if, uh, thinking of the red flag laws, if somebody considers a family member possibly in danger and there and there is and there are guns available legally available within the family what can a person do here how do they what's the process they have to go through this? so so they would call us first uh -huh. and the law the what we call the ERPO law which is the extreme risk protection law policy allows either the police department to take over the case entirely uh -huh. or allows the person who was initially the petitioner to move forward with their petition to have a restraining order, essentially a temporary restraining order. So it's actually called the TERPO. We have fancy names for all that. So, totally, um, like the league. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. So you have the TERPO, which is a temporary restraining yeah. order to remove those guns. Uh, and I, I think, as Teresa was talking, you know, if you looked at the statistics, homes with guns in them, oh, thank you, homes with guns in them, uh, are much more likely to see violence uh, just by very nature of a deadly weapon in the home. So most of that we do know statistically will likely be at the hands of suicide, right? So you have a child who may be going through some difficult crises 
and they're likely to get their hands on a weapon uh, if they're not inclined to use the weapon against themselves and are uh, unfortunately inclined to use that weapon against others. Uh, Burpo is a wonderful interception mechanism. There are others. So I think an, a, another point I would like to add, uh, Mars County, and we adopted it, has what's called the RSVP3 program, which is a program that allows students and parents to anonymously report someone they think may pose a threat, especially in a school environment. Uh, so in school shooting incidents, we know that most of the time, a, a vast majority of the time, the people that commit the violence are actually connected to the school. Yeah. So the violence that happens in the home is usually connected to the people that live in the home, right, uh, with, with guns. So they could call the police department. We can take over as petitioners. They can file the petition themselves. It will remove the weapons temporarily so that mental health Professionals can review the case with a judge and decide whether the the uh, mental health condition was abated to the degree that would make it safe to return the weapons. It is not permanent, but they'll have you believe that this is a method to remove them permanently. It is not. We have hundreds of millions of firearms in homes in this country. Uh, I'm pretty confident we don't have enough police officers to take them all, so it's <laughs> unlikely to ever happen. But what it does do is temporarily remove them so that they don't pose a risk imminently, and then you can intercept and, and, and take action. And it's really important for everyone to know that should you initiate that petition, within 14 days, that petition has to be heard in a court of law. So it's not something that will linger on indefinitely. You will get a judicial decision. 100% because it is a major right. Your Second Amendment right is being infringed, amongst others, right? Your right to be free from illegal searches and seizures or inappropriate searches and seizures. So, 100%. So, so you have a lot of competing rights here, right? So your right to liberty and the pursuit of happiness, right? You have these competing rights. Uh, and, and, and judges and scholars are, uh, uh, and, and Supreme Court justices, appellate court justices, they're supposed to use that Constitution as the guideline for how they do this. We do know that this, you know, sways a little bit one way or the other, uh, and that happens. Uh, but, but ultimately, there are methods in place now to make it safer. There could be more improvements. There could be easy legislation that would help improve it. And then there's some controversial ones, I think, that should be considered. Uh, down the road, but there are there are easy things to do now, and we have a lot of uh, uh, steps in place. So please remind your children, and you yourselves, go on your app, on the app store, on your cell phone. Uh, for those of you who don't have any children uh, in the school district right now, maybe you have grandchildren in the school district, uh, maybe you have no children. You too can consider this. So it is a method for us to get immediate information, and we can start the behavioral threat assessment model which is analyzing this threat using a holistic approach, including counselors, teachers, uh, police personnel, and family members, so that we can identify what the problem is. The truth is, to me, behavioral threat assessments, developing a culture like uh, Raza was saying before, uh, that says, hey, uh, a, a culture that welcomes kids in the school, that's inclusive, that is, uh, uh, eliminates HIV or harassment, intimidating and bullying, is the leading, leading antidote to gun violence, especially in schools. I would argue doing this with adults as well would likely have the same magnificent results. And that's right, Chief, because most of, uh, most gun violence is uh, outside of the schools, but the mass shootings are what garner the most media mm -hmm. attention, right? Mm -hmm. And most uh, uh, school shootings, uh, the perpetrator obtains that firearm from the home of, that they live in or the home of a loved one mm -hmm. or a close friend. So it is imperative to responsibly store Absolutely. your firearm by locking it up, taking the ammunition out, and storing it separately locked up. Period. Full out. And if you don't, then you're going to see me, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to charge you for not doing it. Uh, yeah, my question is, um, as you're speaking about this kind of prevention process that is available to us in New Jersey and Morris County, um, have you seen it, examples of it being effective? 
Mm-hmm. Sure. Yes. So you have. Yes. Mm-hmm. So has this system been used? Is what you're saying? Yes, yes it has. It has. We've we have uh, we have received uh, tips on the system, and Morris County at large has received uh, a considerable number of tips on the system. Chief, you mentioned an app. What app is that? Do you on use? any app. So it is an app. So yeah, if you go on any app, it's called RSVP3. Oh, that's the app. Okay, that's okay. The app. Okay. RSVP3. Oh, RSVP3. <laughs> and one other point I just want to make about, you know, which is more important, and I agree that it's tough to separate yeah, sometimes, yeah. but you said something important, which is the as good as the law is, depending on who's in the, on the Supreme Court, their interpretation mm-hmm. can take uh, precedence over what is probably constitutionally right. So... Again, I think you have to vote in your legislators, you have to vote in your president, because ultimately that's who's appointing these folks. And if they appoint uh, people to the court who have a different way of interpreting the Constitution, it turns us in the wrong direction. Bruin exists because there was a strategic effort over decades to make this happen. I I hope that we explain it. Just like dogs. Yeah, just like dogs. And yeah. it's frightening. Good point. Very well said. Risa, did you want to have anything you want? Oh, there was a question. Is it still a question? Yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the process of taking guns away from somebody uh, who's a threat exists. Uh, very happy to hear that. But I was unaware of it. And I'm wondering how broad the effort has been to make people aware that that this could happen. You know? Did you hear the question, Teresa? The question is, she's glad that there's this program, but Herbo, oh, Herbo exists, but, but didn't know about it before tonight, and how is this public information getting, how is the information getting out to the public? So that... So, I mean, in 2019, when the law was passed, there was a lot in the press, um, Moms Demand Action has a public education arm called One Thing You Can Do. We're, we're available to give 20-minute uh, informational sessions. Um, Chief, how do you disseminate that information on a... Yeah, no, that, that's quite a joke. There's always big money for certain things in legislature, but usually not enough. It's, it's like uh, <laughs> uh, uh, loans and school grants, right? There's a lot of money for grants, and then there's not enough to advertise them. So, yeah. them. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, local police departments, I actually wrote that down, could probably do a better job at putting the word out. Uh, I, I could tell you that when we just recently spoke at the Chatham Middle School with the prosecutor's office, we did mention to all the students there that the RSVP free program is available to them. So we're, we're targeting specifically who needs to know this, but I think in a greater, a, a grander scale, we need parents and, and grandparents to know this as well. Uh, so I, I think it's got to be sort of ground level work. We're ready to work with you. That's it. So, yeah. <laughs> so you combine efforts, basically. Yeah, and Chief, given uh, you have been a, a friend and a supporter yeah. of us in many, many ways, so thank you. So I'm, I'm actually signing on to the gun sense. I, I don't know if you know this, so I'm signing on myself. I have received that questionnaire. Good. So I thank will you. be signing on to the gun sense. Uh, so he, it's because he's running for office where you live? Yes. For board, town board. Right? Yes, for the board of education. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for, for filling out yeah. that application. Yeah. We hope you, we know we will. In Hanover. Okay. Go board. <laughs> <laughs> so Raisa, did you want to add about uh, any, so the question was, how do you disseminate the information around ERPO? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. No, that was it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was, what was the other one? I do know that there's another piece of legislation that deals with um, firearm storage, and they're going in, in that particular piece of legislation. There is a money that goes along with it for public awareness campaign. So sometimes when they do it for other legislation, they're smart and they, they put money in it. Just means it has to go to another committee, which means it's another lo- long procedure, committee hearings, and all that other stuff. So it's not always great, but if you have care about something, there should be money in the, in the uh, yeah. there should be an appropriation that goes along with it. So everybody here, tell 10 friends. Yeah, exactly. Friends exactly. Tell, tell, tell yeah, 10 right. friends. That is, no, the that is word of mouth yeah. on your social media. Go yeah. ahead. I just want to first of all thank, what's your name, Lisa? 
This is Raisa, I'm Teresa, and this is Nancy. I want to thank Raisa in particular. I am so proud of your generation. Yes, at a young age, the way all of you are carrying on these issues, I feel very hopeful. And I'll say the other thing I wanted to thank just you. clarify is that. Um, Hold on one minute, I just want to tell her, she's very grateful for the way your generation is fighting this fight and, and holding yourselves and, and getting, taking action. She's greatly appreciative and applauds you. And you give us hope. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to say. I really is, appreciate that. You're welcome. The other thing I wanted to say uh, is that this controversy over the Second Amendment, um, I want people that don't understand is nobody is saying that you don't have the right to bear arms. Nobody. That's the true. issue is nobody has the right or the need to have an automatic weapon mm -hmm. unless you're in the service. Mm -hmm. yes. And I need that to be clarified while we fight this fight that people are totally stuck on the fact that they don't want the amendment to change because people should have the right to bear arms. But nobody, nobody has a right to have an automatic weapon. I just feel very strong about that. And 90% of the time, 99% of the time, these mass shootings are with automatic weapons. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. So you, you raise a very important <coughs> point, and that is, the Second Amendment is right to bear arms, but the question then becomes, what arms do you have the right to bear? Yeah. We in the United States of America had a 10-year ban on assault rifles, and that was yeah. signed into law. And the only way they could get that signed into law, it was uh, in the 90s under the Clinton administration, the only way it could get signed into law was if there was an endpoint. And so the 10-year endpoint came, and who was in office? President Bush. And it, it was let to lapse and has still not been renewed. There's now uh, major uh, initiatives to try and reinstate the assault weapon ban. But that is another perfect example of who you put into the office at the time that that ban expired. And all of the statistics support everything that you said. Um, I happen to personally, speaking of my own personhood, agree with you. That was legislative ban, ban, by the way, right? Correct. All right. I just want to say, that's to my point. Okay, good. But I think it was 1994 to Correct. 2004 yeah. Yeah. when that ban was in place. That I, I think that the trouble is now, since that ban has expired, there have been hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of these weapons so, now sold. Yeah. So we're, you know, how do we get them out? It's, it's, yeah. it's a tough situation, and it's very controversial. And my point is, there are common sense approaches that are not as controversial. That one happens to be very co controversial. But I, we, we, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here, right? To, then do something else, to do, uh, put some other measures in place, uh, uh, universal uh, mental health checks and things like that, that make it easier so, for the police department. So I don't know if you knew this, but just recently, the judges have sort of uh, turned over the signing for permits to carry to the local police chiefs, yeah. right? So, you know, it, it seems, so they got, don't have enough to do. Yeah, they might have been getting overwhelmed with some of the uh, uh, the permit process, but so we now have the burden of making certain this person qualifies. They're not a certain person, meaning certain person not permitted to own these guns. There's yeah. a lot of checks that go into this. I can tell you, uh, it's a bit exhausting. Yeah. Uh, they're coming in not quite so fast in China, thankfully, but in other uh, departments are coming in really fast. Uh, and there's, uh, it would be nice to have systems that are universal, mm -hmm. that are that are federal systems mm -hmm. that allow us to check to make sure. I, I think everybody agrees. <laughs> people who are stable mentally should be permitted to have the right to bear arms. And if you're not at the time mentally stable, you should not. I don't think that that's a very controversial uh, uh, concession. Chief, do you know? I don't know if you know this answer. Since Bruin ruling came down in New Jersey, how many more permits have been issued so, statewide? Oh, 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 there's a, a huge movement. I, I, I would want to say it's between four and 600 permits per month in New Jersey. You hear this? Uh, and, and there were virtually none.
before. Four to six hundred. So and the reason that justifiable need was quite a hurdle to jump uh, prior to the Bruin case. Uh, you know, four to six hundred new permits, and for us in law enforcement, this is going to be difficult. Uh, because for all of these years, uh, we weren't confronted with this many guns on average citizens driving around. So something we're going to have to sort of adjust to. I know there are other states that do it, and the police departments have a lot of training, so we're, we are getting a lot of tr training. I can tell you the, uh, the, the goal line is moving continuously. The, 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 the bar is moving constantly. So one minute you can have it in this location, then it gets overturned in the appellate, then it gets re reaffirmed. Mm -hmm. uh, so officers are now a bit confused. Yeah. And the last thing you want to have is confused officers yeah. with yeah. civilians yeah. expressing their right to possess a fi uh, firearm in a situation that might be a little bit tense where officers for many years in New Jersey were not routinely confronting people with firearms unless in most cases they were uh, committing violent crimes. Uh, they typically were not carrying these firearms. I mean, you were permitted to carry a firearm uh, prior to in certain situations, uh, and you were permitted to travel with those firearms in certain situations uh, that are covered in law, but this now allows it to be done regularly. And I will say, for those of you who do decide to get a permit to carry a firearm, yeah. it is an extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary responsibility. The liability is extraordinary. The potential for criminal liability is increased dramatically. So as you might imagine, you, you have your gun, and now you walk into a location and you didn't realize that they're selling alcohol in there, or you did not realize it's considered uh, a daycare center or a, or a mass uh, gathering location, and now you're in this quagmire where you may be confronted with both criminal law and civil law, depending on what you do. Then if you're confronted with a situation worse yet, where there is some degree of chaos or violence that happens, and then you decide with your civilian permit to carry to then draw that weapon. If it's in self-defense, I, I can appreciate that. But if you decide to do this in defense of others, uh, that it's noble, but be prepared. I can tell you, we have all been doing this for a long time, all the officers in the room here for a long time, and we have been confronted with very sticky liability issues that exist. and. We're permitted to do it on a regular basis and train thousands of hours to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you don't have that at uh, uh, you know at home, you you're really putting your livelihood, your homes, your potentially your freedom at risk if you're not careful. I just as a word of caution, be very very careful. Thank you. That's important. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa, did you have something you want to add? We're just checking in. Feel bad that you can't hear everything, so just want to make sure. Is she frozen? Yeah. 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 I'm not sure how well she can hear. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah. I can hear a little bit, not very well. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're trying to, I, what I was asking is, do you want to add anything to this conversation that you wanted to say and didn't get a chance to or relate to any of the questions? Um, because people want to hear from you more than us. <laughs> <laughs> any specific questions for Verizon? I have one for her. Uh-huh. Is come it, over here, see. To, yeah, come over here. I, I actually think this is where the microphone is. That is that it? Oh, okay. It's on the table. No, 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 I think we switched it to Epson. Yeah, because the yeah, owl wasn't on it, was it? Yes, yeah. yeah. okay. So, yeah. Can you hear me here? No. Yeah. yeah. It, come, come speak under here. I'm not certain that'll work. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm really interested. This is actually a question from Ruth, but I'm interested being that I went to school, public school, a long, long time ago, particularly from your frame of reference. And the scariest thing we ever had to do was fire drills. How this has affected your generation practicing for active student drills. And any comments you'd like to make on that? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question, and it's a really important one. I think it's had a tremendous impact. Um, I know it, it certainly it depends from person to person, the kind of individual mental health impact. There are definitely people for whom it has been incredibly traumatic. 
especially in circumstances where school districts aren't always very clear about what's going on. They don't always communicate very well in these circumstances. Sometimes I think they don't necessarily know how much they can communicate, but the lines between knowing when is it a drill, when is it real, sometimes aren't the clearest. And I think that's a huge issue. Um, and I know that it has, I mean, it has contributed to some pretty severe PTSD. Um, in addition to that, I think, uh, I think another response is just a very intense desensitization to it. Those are kind of the two responses I think you see, um, where it's just, you, you kind of get into the habit of hearing about all these shootings that are happening and you just sort of, you know, get immensely, immensely just used to it and kind of numb to it to the degree that you can kind of make jokes during lockdown drills. Um, and I think that those are kind of the types of impacts that you've seen. But even when you see those on the individual level, it's also the question of how does this lead to kind of at a communal level. Um, and I think we see um, we see a lot more efforts to kind of, in a lot of ways, sort of militarize schools because of this threat, um, which is not necessarily, and a lot of times it's not making school environments Safe, feel safer for students. It's just this understanding of the intense threat that they're under and, you know, bringing in measures that contribute to the school to prison pipeline. Um, and so I think that that is a huge issue too. It's not just the incredibly personal health impacts that it has, it's also how it leads to policy, what kind of an environment it creates around that. So I think it's a huge issue. Um, one of the things March for Our Lives has been discussing actually this is very, very um, much still an idea in the making, um, but um, I think a lot of times there isn't necessarily, there's an awareness that this is an issue, but not necessarily an inherently student perspective on this. Um, so we've been talking about trying to develop um, a student bill of rights um, framework, which would include needing to provide more information and follow more trauma-informed procedures during lockdown drills, but it would also sort of expand beyond that. Um, it would just sort of cover the idea that students in schools should have certain rights um, because schools are supposed to be places of safety. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, we know that they aren't. And so we have to, um, that can include um, students having the right to privacy around information um, to be able to get um, medical procedures that they might need. Um, it can include um, the need for student representation because right now school boards aren't necessarily, are accountable to about 1% of the student body maybe because only 18 year olds in the senior class are able to vote for them. So it's a little broader. I don't want to get off topic, but I just wanted to bring that up as one of the things we've been discussing. <laughs> I'm excited for that potential. Mm -hmm. yes. Agreed. Do we have any final questions? We promised the library we would try to be out 8.30-ish. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any final questions before Nancy closes? Guess not. I want to thank you all for coming. On behalf of the AAUW and the League of Women Voters and Moms Demand Action, and March for Our Lives and our Chatham Township. Chatham Borough. Chatham, Chatham, Chatham Borough. Borough. Sorry, thank I always do that. Uh, we we appreciate Chatham the invite. Thank you very much. Appreciate um, the invite. Thank you all for coming out. I also just wanted to say that the League of Voters is doing candidate forums right now. So your boards of education, your councils and committees, they should be debating. And if they're not, you should call the candidates up and ask them why they're not debating um, within, in the League sponsored debates. And, and ask if you do attend a debate or answer, ask the gun question. Ask them where they stand on, on these issues. We're also, um, so on the 21st is the Chatham Township um, Committee debate. And on 1016 is the Morris District Board of Education debate. Those are the ones that I thought this room would be more interested in. And I also forgot, Anne isn't the only one who forgot her handouts with the QR code. I forgot to bring. A, a league handout on Thursday. This Thursday, we're having 
a neighborhood gathering at just Jersey and Morristown um, at 6.30 or 7, I forget. Six. Oh, six. six. I'm sorry. Six. It's at six. It was designed so that you could come after work before you go out or before you go home. And, um, and it's, besides being able to shop for things at Just Jersey and uh, have some refreshments, we we're going to have one of our uh, senior organizers talk about a piece of legislation that we're hoping to get through during Lane Duck. Um, it deals with same day voter registration, uh, which is really important, particularly for students. Um, it allows people to register on the day of the election, so you don't have this arbitrary 21 days ahead of time where you have to be registered, and if you move or if you're going to a different school or whatever. So um, she'll be speaking about that briefly, and it's just going to be social. So if you're, if you're around Thursday night, come and join us at Just Jersey in Morristown on South Street. And thank you to the AAUW and to Ruth and, and Susan for organizing this. I think it was a great panel. It was Great questions, and thank you all for coming on. Thank you. Did we need to change any of the settings on that computer back? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Also, we support, March 4th, we support St. Judy's Registration.